to Inspiring Affinity. Welcome to Inspiring Affinity. Welcome to Inspiring Affinity. In the 1930s, Dr. Wilhelm Reich, a prominent Austrian physician and psychoanalyst, discovered a powerful new physical energy and for the next two decades devoted his life to the investigation of its laws and properties. He confirmed the existence of this energy in the human body, verified its presence in the atmosphere, developed instrumentation to observe and collect it, and harnessed it for a variety of purposes, from cancer treatment to motor power to weather experimentation. Reich called his discovery Orgone Energy. But tragically, it was a discovery that the world was not ready for. was born in 1897 in Galicia, the easternmost part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, now the Ukraine. He grew up in Bukovina on a large farm operated by his father. Until he was 13 years old, Reich was educated at home by tutors. His mother, to whom he was devoted, committed suicide in 1910, after his father discovered she had had a brief affair with one of the tutors. His father died four years later from tuberculosis. That same year, 1914, the First World War broke out. Within days, Russian troops swept through Bukovina. Reich narrowly escaped being sent to Russia as a hostage and had to flee his home. Later he wrote, I never saw either my homeland or my possessions again. Of a well-to-do past, nothing was left. For the next four years, Reich served in the Austrian army, experiencing what he called the war as a machine. In 1918, the war finally ended. Germany and Austria were defeated. The Austro-Hungarian Empire was broken up and Bukovina became a part of Romania. Alone, homeless, and intellectually starved after four years of war, Reich entered the medical school at the University of Vienna. Reich's recognition of the significance of sexuality drew him to the work of Dr. Sigmund Freud, the father of psychoanalysis. Soon he was considered one of Freud's most promising students. Freud had discovered that neuroses are caused by the conflict between natural sexual instincts and the social denial and frustration of those instincts. Freud had also hypothesized the existence of a biological sexual energy in the body. He called it libido and described it as something which is capable of increase, decrease, displacement, and discharge, and which extends itself over the memory traces of an idea, like an electric charge over the surface of the body. But as the years passed, Freud and his followers diluted much of this concept, reducing the libido to little more than a psychological energy or idea. By 1925, Freud had concluded that the libido theory may therefore, for the present, be pursued only by the path of speculation. Reich's clinical observations, however, demonstrated that sexual energy was more than just an idea, and that sexual satisfaction, in fact, alleviated neurotic symptoms. He discovered that the function of the orgasm is to maintain an energy equilibrium by discharging excess biological energy that builds up naturally in the body. 
if that discharge function is disturbed, as it proved to be in all his patients, this energy continues to build up without adequate release, stagnating and fueling neurotic disorders. Reich's orgasm theory set him apart from his colleagues because it indicated that the libido was a real physical energy that possibly might be measured quantitatively. His clinical work also led to new therapeutic techniques designed to discover and eliminate any impediments to the flow and discharge of this energy. But the widespread existence of human misery forced Reich to conclude that the solution to the problem of neuroses was not treatment, it was prevention. You have to revamp your whole way of thinking, said Reich, so that you don't think from the standpoint of the state and the culture, but from the standpoint of what people need and what they suffer from. Then you arrange your social institutions accordingly. Freud, on the other hand, maintained that culture takes precedence, that sexual instincts must be adapted to the existing social structure. These conflicting positions led to an eventual break between Reich and Freud. In Vienna and later in Berlin, Reich devoted much of his time and money educating working class people about the essential role of sexuality in their lives. I had six clinics in Vienna, said Reich, where people came and received advice once or twice a week. To provide medical and educational help was its purpose. To reach the greatest number of people, he worked within the socialist and communist parties to promote sex education, birth control, divorce rights, and better housing. Reich recalled that in Berlin, there were about 50,000 people in my organization in the first year. Reich was also very outspoken about Germany's turbulent political climate. Unlike most members of the Berlin Psychoanalytic Association, Reich openly opposed the rise of the Nazi party. But his activities exacted a high price. He was denounced by the communists and expelled from the International Psychoanalytic Association, calling these events catastrophes which threaten my personal, professional, and social existence. When asked what he would do, Reich replied, just go on. University of Oslo, 1935. While continuing to teach and develop his innovative therapeutic techniques, Reich began a series of laboratory experiments to verify the existence of a physical, biological energy expressed in the emotions. Using human subjects, Reich was able to demonstrate a charge at the skin surface directly related to feelings of pleasure or anxiety. The charge would increase when a subject experienced pleasure and decrease during feelings of unpleasure. From this, Reich concluded that pleasure is the movement of biological energy toward the periphery of the organism, while anxiety is the movement of this energy toward the center. He assumed this energy to be electrical, but was it? and did similar energy processes exist in more basic life forms. Reich discovered that under certain conditions, sterilized and unsterilized substances, such as grass, blood, sand, charcoal, and foodstuffs, disintegrate into pulsating vesicles that exhibit a bluish color. He called these vesicles bions. Reich observed internal motility in the bions, an effect of energy. He also found that certain bions revealed a strong radiation phenomenon seen here as a white field around the organism and that these bions could kill bacteria and cancer cells. 
This radiation confirmed the existence of an energy that did not obey any known laws of electricity or magnetism. Reich called this energy orgone because its discovery had evolved from his investigation of the orgasm function and because this energy could charge organic matter. When he published his findings, the scientific and psychiatric communities responded with a vicious year-long attack in the Norwegian press. In the wake of this response and the inevitability of a second world war, Reich began to look to America as the future home for his work. In August 1939, Reich sailed for America on the last ship to leave Norway before World War II broke out. Reich settled in the Forest Hill section of New York City. He taught at the New School for Social Research in Manhattan. Published his books in English. Trained American physicians in his therapeutic techniques. And pursued his investigations of orgone energy. Since the energy appeared to be everywhere and to permeate all substances, Reich had to find ways to isolate and collect it in order to study its functions and make it usable. Experiments demonstrated that organic or non-metallic materials, such as cotton, wool, or plastic, attract, absorb, and hold the energy. Metallic materials, steel or iron, attract the energy and quickly reflect it in both directions. On the basis of these experiments, Reich constructed small boxes with alternating layers of organic and metallic materials, with the inner walls lined with metal. The organic layers attract the atmospheric orgone energy, which is then directed inward by the metal layers. Any energy reflected outward by the metal layers is reabsorbed by the organic material, attracted back to the metal and directed toward the inside of the box. The result, a higher concentration of orgone energy inside the box. The more layers, the higher the concentration. This accumulation of energy can be verified in a variety of ways. For example, a constant temperature difference exists between the air above the box and in the surrounding air, contradicting the second law of thermodynamics. There also exists a slower electroscopic discharge rate in the higher orgone concentration within the box. These layered boxes, known as orgone energy accumulators, became a valuable tool in Reich's scientific and medical research. Initially, they were used to observe visual manifestations of orgone energy within the enclosure and to test the effects of orgone radiation on cancer mice. Because his results with cancer mice were so promising, Reich decided to test the effects of orgone radiation on human subjects. He constructed orgone energy accumulators that were large enough for a person to sit in, and in 1942, he began experimental treatments with cancer patients. They were all terminal cases. Reich promised no cure and charged no money. Over a period of time, the patients showed marked improvement, relief of pain, healthier blood condition, weight gain, and the shrinkage and elimination of tumors. Despite these positive results, the patients died, reinforcing Reich's conviction that cancer is a bioenergetic shrinking following emotional resignation, and that the tumors themselves are not the disease, but merely a local manifestation of a deeper systemic disorder. Once again, Reich's focus became prevention. Reich also discovered that water and high humidity absorb 
and hold Oregon Energy, making it difficult to carry out experimental work in New York City during the summer. In 1940, on a camping trip to New England, Reich discovered the Rangeley Lakes region in Maine. With its low humidity and clean air, it provided an ideal environment for his work. In 1942, Reich purchased an old farm bordering on a small lake. He called it Organon and envisioned it as a permanent home for the various branches of his work. In 1945, a student's laboratory was built. Three years later, construction began on an Orgone Energy Observatory, which included additional laboratory facilities, Reich's study and library, and outdoor observation decks. Funding for these buildings and for Reich's research came exclusively from his own income as a physician and teacher and from loans and contributions by students. By 1947, after less than eight years in America, Reich's work was attracting considerable interest as Oregon research expanded into new areas of psychiatry, medicine, and biophysics. One of Reich's most significant new developments was the discovery of a motor force in Oregon energy that had enormous practical implications. Here, Reich demonstrates a small motor being propelled by Oregon energy from the body. And here, motor powers provided by Oregon energy harnessed from the atmosphere. With the development of Organon, Reich's dream of a home for his work was slowly becoming a reality. Sadly, it was a dream that he would not see fulfilled. In 1947, this article written by freelance journalist Mildred Brady appeared in New Republic magazine. It was filled with distortions and innuendos about Reich's sexual theories and Orgon research. Brady's most inflammatory claim was that Reich was building accumulators of Orgon energy which are rented out to patients who presumably derive orgastic potency from it. Implying that Reich was a danger to the public Brady challenged the medical authorities to take action against him. Two months later, the article was brought to the attention of the Federal Food and Drug Administration. The result was a 10-year campaign by the FDA designed to destroy Reich's work. The FDA focused on the Orgone Energy Accumulator, which Reich and other physicians were using experimentally with patients. Convinced that the accumulator was being fraudulently promoted as a sexual and medical device, FDA agents spent years interviewing Reich's associates, physicians, students, and patients looking for dissatisfied accumulator users. None were ever found. As the FDA attack continued, so did Reich's work. He continued to develop new ways to visualize, measure, and harness orgone energy from the atmosphere. The Cloudbuster, for example, was an experimental instrument that could affect weather patterns by altering concentrations of orgone energy in the atmosphere. A set of hollow metal pipes and cables inserted into water creates a stronger orgone energy system 
than that in the surrounding atmosphere. Water, which strongly attracts and absorbs orgone, draws the atmospheric energy through the pipes. This movement of orgone from a lower to a higher energy system was used by Reich to create clouds and to dissipate them. In 1953, during a long drought that threatened the main blueberry crop, several farmers offered to pay Reich if he could bring rain to the parched region. The Weather Bureau had forecast no rain for several days when Reich began his cloud-busting operations. Ten hours later, a light rain began to fall. Over the next few days, close to two inches fell. The blueberry crop was saved. In February 1954, the FDA filed a complaint for injunction against Reich in the federal court in Portland, Maine. The complaint declared that orgone energy does not exist. It asked the court to prohibit the shipment of accumulators in interstate commerce and to ban Reich's published literature, which they claim was labeling for the accumulators. Reich responded to the complaint with a lengthy letter to Judge John Clifford, explaining that he could not appear in court since doing so would allow a court of law to judge basic scientific research. Scientific matters, he wrote, can only be clarified by prolonged, faithful, bona fide observations in friendly exchange of opinion, never by litigation. I therefore submit, in the name of truth and justice, that I shall not appear in court. Judge Clifford did not accept Reich's letter as a valid legal response and the injunction was issued on default as if Reich had never responded at all. But the injunction was even more excessive than the initial complaint. It ordered that all Oregon energy accumulators and their parts were to be destroyed. It ordered all materials containing instructions for the use of the accumulator to be destroyed as well. It also banned a list of Reich's books containing statements about orgone energy until such time as all references to orgone energy were deleted. After the initial shock, Reich continued his work, traveling to Arizona to experiment with the Cloudbuster in the dry desert environment. While he was there, and without his knowledge, one of Reich's students, Dr. Michael Silvert, moved a truckload of accumulators and books from Rangeley, Maine to New York City, a direct violation of the injunction. As a result, the FDA charged Reich and Silvert with criminal contempt of court. In 1956, both men were found guilty. Reich was sentenced to two years in a federal prison. While Reich appealed his sentence, the government carried out the destruction of accumulators and literature. In New York City, several tons of Reich's books and other publications were burned in one of the city's garbage incinerators, including titles that were only to have been banned. This destruction of literature constitutes one of the most heinous acts of censorship in United States history. All appeals denied on March 11, 1957, two weeks shy of his 60th birthday, Wilhelm Reich was imprisoned at the Federal Penitentiary in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. He died there of heart failure eight months later on November 3, 1957, and was buried at Organon. But the tragedy of Reich's death should not be allowed to overshadow the richness of his life. For while he lived, he was truly alive.
in the course of the history of natural science, it always happened that profound or true thoughts or true facts were always either distorted or flattened out. The danger, especially of distortion, is particularly great in the case of urbanity. We must be scientific, we cannot be political in these matters. And I personally declare that I will be the first to fight with all my strengths, with whatever I've got, against such a distortion of our principles.